Okay, hi, good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, around the world. Uh, this is E. Trey, together with my uh, co-director of Storage X, uh, Professor Will Chair. We would like to welcome you to our Storage X symposium again. And this time, the X equals to heat. In the past six months, you have been seeing, uh, we have uh, outstanding speakers and lithium ion batteries and new chemistry, high energy, and, uh, and also in the uh, uh, large scale production industry panel as well. Our storage X, the mean of X is expanding. So in today's symposium, we have X equals to heat with two experts uh, to join us, uh, Professor Bob Laughlin at Stanford University and Andrew Ponak, the CEO of uh, Antora Com Energy Company. Um, I will start by introducing uh, Bob Laughlin first and my co-director, uh, Professor Will Chair will introduce Andrew later. Uh, it's absolutely a great honor to introduce Bob. I joined in the Stanford faculty in 2005. Uh, well, luckily my office uh, was in the same floor as Bob. Um, pretty soon after I joined in, after Bob uh, uh, come back from Stanford, uh, to, to Stanford from KAIST uh, as the KAIST president, I have the uh, fortune to uh, the opportunity to interact with Bob. Uh, he is uh, absolutely an intellectual thinker. Uh, he is curious uh, about many, many research topics. Uh, certainly he has achieved a lot. Um, he's a Nobel Prize winner in 1998 for his uh, explanation of uh, fractional, uh, the quantum Hall effect. Um, and uh, he has uh, understanding on many research topics. Uh, I remember my uh, group meeting on the third floor of McCullough building, Bob. Um, maybe you still remember. Uh, oftentimes I have a group meeting, Bob walking in the hallway, uh, peeking through the window and seeing, wow, this topic is interesting. Bob will come into my group meeting and have a very active discussion with my whole research group. That was just fantastic to have your intellectual um, horsepower to participate in my group. So over the years, of course, Bob cares about, you know, what's going on in the world, particularly climate change. He also put his uh, intellectual horsepower behind this problem and try to come up solution for it. That is the reason we invite Bob today to speak about the topic he has been working on, the uh, Brayton uh, batteries for the you know, large scale energy storage. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Bob onto the stage to start his presentation. Wow, what an introduction, thank you. Uh, uh, it's all true, of course. Good morning, everybody. Uh, wherever you are, thank you for tuning in uh, to uh, listen to me talk for a little bit. So as Professor Trey uh, said, uh, the topic today is this, this image that I'm showing you here. It's a storage technology. And uh, there's a story behind it that I want to tell you, but this is, I like to start seminars from the answer. The answer is this. What this is a picture of is a closed cycle Brayton engine. You see there's a working fluid going around and around in it. This is a compressor turbine pair. Uh, these are, uh, these, tan these round things are counterflow heat exchangers and the tanks contain heat storage fluid. Uh, in the case of the hot one, uh, it's uh, molten nitrate salt. In the case of the, the cold one, the blue one, 
it's uh, uh, something else that we argue about uh, that for the time being is uh, not not important. The the uh, technology is electro is 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 electromechanical. That is to say, there is a uh, not there is no connection from the uh, the the grid to any electrochemistry. It's entirely mechanical. Now, um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, before I jump into my slides, let me tell everybody that uh, I came to this uh, this particular approach the long way. My background is not in mechanical engineering. My background is in semiconductors and also actually in batteries. I have quite a lot of electrochemistry background from my time at Bell Labs. And it was thinking about the limitations of semiconductors and electrochemistry generally that uh, led me uh, to this particular approach. Uh, the uh, uh, reasons, therefore, for uh, looking at this, a machine like this, as opposed to some other, are important and require discussing. But I want to make clear, it's not because I don't understand electrochemistry, it's because I do understand it. This is a, uh, a formal cup publication that uh, occurred in 2017 uh, <coughs> in Bloomberg. <coughs> and I'm showing this chiefly to emphasize that there are a lot of aspects of the technology that I can't talk about today. The flip side of doing some, trying to do something important is that other people's money gets involved. And uh, they then call the shots. And uh, so I have uh, NDA restrictions on what I can talk to you about today. But everything I am talking to you about today is, is uh, clear. Let's start with the problem. This uh, is a double graph. The bottom of this graph shows the total energy consumption of the world as a function of time. You must see it steadily growing. And then you see that the, uh, the coal, oil, and natural gas components are also steadily growing. This little yellow sliver here is renewable. And we like to think, well, the bulk of that is wind. And the wind, of course, is growing like crazy. But this is not so. One third of that yellow, uh, yellow sliver is corn ethanol. And uh, corn ethanol uh, may or may not be renewable, depending on how you do the calculation with the diesel used in the agriculture. So there's a market penetration problem with renewables that we all know about, and there, there it is. Now at the top, uh, you see the Keeling curve, which is the CO2 concentration measured at the top of Mount Aloha as a function of time. And what you see is that the steady increase in CO2 concentration has continued over the course of time, and in particular, while this yellow sliver is growing. So this is a problem that's out of control and that is not solved. Now, we're talking about electricity, not cars. We're talking about electric grid, and this is a distillation of what the electricity problem is. This is a plot of the power used by the uh, California ISO, all of California as a function of time for a particular day in 2009. It doesn't really matter uh, what the day was. What you see is two curves here at the bottom. The gray one is a theory made two days before about what the load is going to be. And then the red one is the experiment. So that's the amount of uh, power that the, the, the load actually demands. And you see uh, they, it does pretty well, but the variation is enormous. It's a 50% variation. The green line at the top is standby uh, power. So the green line is uh, contracted to, to stay online, but not turned on and to be ready to switch into the grid if there is a shortfall you know, with, the, with the red line. 
electricity companies like to say that they manufacture electricity when it's needed. Uh, and the reason they do that is there's no way to store it. The good news about light is, is electricity is it travels at the speed of light. The bad news is that it travels at the speed of light and therefore you can't store it anywhere uh, without creating explosion danger. Actually, you can't store it at all. It, it's, it, uh, the technologies for doing this have cost problems. So this is the problem. You, there, there are other grid storage problems that occur on longer time scales. But the, but the first one, the first one you have to deal with is this 24 hour uh, surge. As a result of this problem, the price of electricity produced by the wind becomes negative in many parts of the world. It certainly happens here. It definitely happens in Northern China. It happens in Northern Europe. So the wind blows and it produces electricity, but the electricity is not needed. So the wind producers are willing to sell it to the, the distributor for negative prices. What does that mean? It means they have to pay the grid to take the power and they still make profit because they have a subsidy. But uh, it's obviously very bad business-wise and it's telling you there's a, there's a problem. In the case of China, which is a particularly important market, we know that the wind people have been ordered to stop making windmills because of this problem. A way to stash very large amounts of energy that works and that's known, uh, you pump water uphill. There is a number of problems with this, but the uh, point is that in the, this country, the United States, the amount of so-called pump storage, uh, storage capacity for storing energy is about one quarter of what one needs for the whole country. So in principle, one could build the rest of it. This is very important because it's the first indication that the core of this problem is not technology, it's money. What's holding up the building of these, of these facilities is a money problem. There is also danger. So when we're thinking about storing really large amounts of energy for cities, uh, there, th that amount of energy is dangerous. So it's a very different proposition from a car. Car will burn up, it's, so it's too bad, you lose the car. But if, if a big facility um, uh, fails, it can destroy uh, lives, a great number of them. So there's a danger problem and um, it's big. So. A big metropolitan area, uh, like I picked Metro, uh, LA Metro, storing um, the power consumption of LA Metro for eight hours is the uh, energy equivalent of a pretty large nuclear weapon. It's not the biggest, but it's not the smallest either. So it's the largest nuclear weapon, which is to say, if you store this energy in a place where it can come out quickly, you have created an explosion danger big enough to destroy cities. So this amount of energy is really dangerous and uh, way at the top of one's engineering considerations has to be safety. Uh, the failure of pumped hydro uh, was facilitated in part by the development of this. Uh, this is an industrial gas turbine it comes to us from the, uh, from the airplane industry. It is a fabulous technology. And right now uh, the, in the world, this is the technology that levels the load. In those cases where you don't have hydropower to turn off and on, uh, instead you turn off and on these extremely cheap gas turbines. They work wonderfully and uh, they, uh, they're reliable. So the power producers like them. So when we're talking about storage technology, it's important to keep in mind that this is the technology to beat. Uh, the uh, batteries would be great, but right now it's all happening with uh, the what amount to jet engines. Now, this is also critical to the 
uh, to the problem. This uh, is a plot of uh, total, in California, total power versus time of day for a particular day. Uh, actually, it was April 2019, last year. Now, let me call your attention to this great big yellow blub bubble here. This is the, the energy supply from the solar fields in the Mojave Desert. And you'll see over here that the big peak in demand is much later in the, in the day. And at present, it's handled by, uh, by some hydro chiefly imported from the Pacific Northwest, but mainly turning on these, these natural gas uh, turbines. Now, so there's a time shift problem between when the sun shines and when the uh, load is that could in principle be solved by a storage uh, technology, but isn't. Now, centrally important for battery people is this picture up here. This is also from the California ISO showing the battery flows in and out of the grid as a function of time over the, at the same day. And you'll notice that the units are the same. So it's, it's in multiples of gigawatts and it goes from minus 0.1 to 0.1. So this curve, I can't plot it on the bottom here because it wouldn't show, it would be too small. So what we're talking about here is kind of a hundred megawatts in and out maximum for periods of maybe 20 minutes. Now, this is uh, chiefly lithium ion. And there's a message here, which is this. There is a business model to use batteries for stabilizing the phase of the grid. That's what these 20 minute excursions are. But there is not a business model to uh, level that big solar load. So this curve tells you that batteries can interact with the grid very nicely, but they have a cost problem uh, that, that makes it not possible right now for them to, to, to make solar energy really work. So that means it all depends on cost. And now when we're talking about cost, this is not science folks, this is science fiction. And I apologize for this, but now I'm, I'm showing you this picture chiefly to illustrate. Now, uh, first of all, this red line is my technology. Why is it the best? Well, it's my graph. Okay, so I get to make, I get to make the graph any way I want. So I, I show the technology I prefer to be the best. That's not the important thing right now. The important thing is that there are two metrics, not one for, uh, for how it functions. One, one is the intercept down here. This is what I call the cost per engine watt. Um, this is the uh, amount that it costs you, like for example, a pump storage facility, it's the cost of the dam and the, and the, um, and the generators. And, but if there's no lake, you don't, you don't store any power. So the cost per watt as a function of, of storage hours, it's what plotted here. One of the numbers is the intercept. The other number is the slope. And the slope of this line is denominated in, in, in uh, cost per joule. So it's a cost per watt of the intercept and a cost per joule. Now, what you see is that at short time scales, batteries win, and that will just be forever. So when we're doing things like load leveling of the phase, uh, the technology is already here. There is no need uh, to make new technologies out there deployed, it's fine. Where we get into trouble is out around four hours. And there's a crossing. Now, the green line, which are lithium, you'll notice they're, they're sloping upwards. Why is this? Well, the way conventional batteries work is that the engine and the storage medium are the same thing. So you can't, they're the, basically the electrode. And so you cannot buy more storage without buying more engine. And so uh, that's why the slope is so steep. You're basically buying more electrode when you make a bigger battery. And that slope is eventually what kills you for a long, long duration. Pumped hydro by contrast, uh, the storage medium and engine are separate. And um, 
And so once you've got the engine built, then the st more storage costs you nothing. Uh, it's just the slope there is so small, it doesn't matter. So these are kind of the two paradigms. And right at the moment, historically, where the crossing point is, is about four hours. Now, um, I've got a flow battery uh, line up here. I don't have time to talk about this right now, uh, but let's, uh, let's uh, move on. So this is the basic idea that the, to make, to get the price down, it's necessary for long duration, it's necessary to separate the, uh, the engine from the storage medium. Now, um, that holding that thought, I want you to travel with me to Southern Spain. And you look at that solar field in the background there and you'll see those two little tanks. Those two little tanks are filled with molten nitrate salt this is a technology that's deployed already, uh, chiefly in concentrating solar plants, and it's deployed a lot. What happens is the solar heat uh, heats uh, molten salt. Uh, there's these two tanks have molten salt in them at two different temperatures, and you pump from the cold side to the hot side and, and uh, heat with the solar field. And then at night, you do the other way around. You go from the hot tank to the cold one and run a, and run a steam turbine. Now, the important thing for us right now is that this technology is widely deployed. So the first uh, deployments were Andesol 1, 2, and 3. This happened in 2008. Uh, they're 50 megawatts because there was a limit placed on the Spanish, by the Spanish government. But now you see the massive uh, replication of the technology, including uh, many uh, facilities in China. Now, uh, what this tells you is that the investors think, think they can get their money back, okay? So this is the, the first deployment is the technology. Now the technology exists. The investors are willing to put their money down because they, they're, they're persuaded that the technology works. Now, when I was researching for all this, uh, I, I got very depressed. You know, why, why can't you do this for the wind? Because wind is, there's a lot more wind deployed in the world than, than solar energy. And um, then it hit me that you could. And uh, the reason is because energy storage is not about energy, it's about entropy. So your, your task uh, is, is, is to take the jewels and put them somewhere in a way that minimizes the amount of entropy that you create. Um, now, it turns out that modern jet engine technology is so good that it actually makes relatively little entropy. So the, the engines have tremendous power and they're quite small. This is true also for steam technology, by the way. Um, so, so actually these are pretty good uh, in the entropy department. So that means uh, you can run them backwards. So, Let's do a very quick um, review of how a jet engine works. Here's a compressor, here's a turbine, the air goes in one side, there's some fire. At this point, I usually ask a physics audience, you know, what, what's the difference between the compressor and the turbine? And they say they don't know because they don't, it's very subtle. Actually, the pressure in this, in this uh, chamber here is uniform, but it's hotter at one end than the other. And the work done is PDV. So the, the, it's the volume expansion associated with the heat that is, uh, makes the turbine different from the compressor. Otherwise, they're just a, they're just a couple of fans. So um, you can imagine now getting rid of the fire and putting in place of it uh, a, what amounts to a locomotive boiler with some hot fluid, let's say molten salt, going one way and the uh, working fluid of the turbine going the other. And if you counterflow them, as I've shown here, um, then the temperature drop between uh, the two sides, one going one way, one going the other, is very small. And this can be made as small as you want just by making the heat exchanger as big as you want. So with proper amount of steel deployed here, you can get rid of the entropy creation in the heat exchange. Uh, now, 
this leads to the picture that I showed you, which has just exactly that. The heat, heat exchanger is replacing the fire. And then we have uh, a mirror uh, image of that on the low pressure side to, uh, that basically does the same thing with chronogen. There is uh, a whole bunch of mechanical engineering cycle stuff uh, that we could talk about offline. Um, this is all published in the referee literature. Uh, this cycle uh, involves heat going in and heat going out. This is actually a charge cycle. All you do to switch from charge to discharge mode is that you run the movie backwards. If it's not making any entropy, then you can run the movie backwards and you, what used to be an engine is now a storage machine. Now, um, there are some other things here that matter. This uh, making these technologies for heat involves materials and it's sort of a quintessential material problem. I'm running out of time here, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip this. If those of you who are interested, please uh, have a look at the, the uh, materials considerations, particularly the considerations of the steels. It turns out that the molten salts in question have a wonderful coincidence with what's called the creep cliff <clears throat> of, of modern steels. And it's right where they, where they begin not having any strength. <clears throat> so this, this is where supercritical steam plants uh, work. And this is exactly where the molten salt plant works also. Um, let's skip this. Here, those of you who are interested, here are the equations for the turbines. There, is, there are two numbers here called the adiabatic efficiencies per stage, or so-called polytropic efficiencies. The, uh, <clears throat> there's a little formula for what the round trip efficiency is for the entropy you're making, which is easy to calculate. And it turns out to be 0.7, actually 0.73. So the asymptotic efficiency of this machine is somewhere in the low 70s. And uh, that is enough uh, to make money, especially since the heat you're losing isn't lost. It's actually discarded at a uh, temperature that's useful for other things. The engine in question is not new. This uh, was the first closed cycle engine uh, 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 gas turbine ever built. It was built just before the uh, outbreak of World War II in Switzerland. There are, there's a history of plants uh, that have been built chiefly for coal burning. So the po important point is that the technology side, the, the turbo machinery side of the, uh, the technology is, uh, exists and it exists uh, with uh, corroboration of all the key numbers. Now, when you're doing stuff that matters, um, you have to do this. This is a whole bunch of patents. And the, uh, you'll see I'm first author on all of them and sole author on the first one. Much of what's happened uh, in this subject has been dictated by the history of, the, of, of these patents. And uh, this is a, another subject to talk about that I don't want to get onto right now. Uh, this patent stuff has to do with secrecy. It's exactly the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing in university. But anyway, there you are. Um, moving forward to do something about this problem, you have to do get involved with people's uh, other people's money. So I meant at the end now, the technology I put on the table is actually not different from underground case storing. The observation is simply that when you compress air, compress a gas, the energy is stored in its heat, not in the pressure. It's storing energy and pressure makes no sense. So actually underground pressure storage has always has a heat transfer section at the, at the top. And what the technology is we're talking about here is you just get rid of the cavern. And instead of doing one compression and do a compression followed by an expansion. So there is no need for the cavern anymore. No explosion danger because everything is in thermal equilibrium. The stuff is hot, but it can't ever explode. So the nuclear explosion danger is gone. No land use issues. So deploying pumped hydro has the problem that it uses land, which people don't like. And out here in Western United States, where we live, 
the water is more valuable than the power. Uh, I'm talking to battery people, so let's just say um, I'm not a great fan of flow batteries um, because of this little ion exchange membrane problem in the middle, but we're running out of time now, so I can't talk about that. The semiconductor issue is something I hope that will come up today. Uh, the grid operators turn out hate semiconductors because the way the grid works is actually mechanical. And they much prefer to have what they call rotating assets on, the, on their grid. And I'm done. Thank you, everybody, for your patience and your forbearance. And I think maybe I ran over five minutes. And if I did, I apologize. Bob, I think you are fine. You are just uh, about on time. You are not running over. So that's good. <laughs> OK, good. Yeah. Uh, so great. Well, thank you for your great talk. Um, let, let me start by asking you uh, uh, questions. Um, looking at the Brayton battery using uh, <clears throat> the Morton salt, right? what would still be the biggest one or two challenges, you know, in order to make this to work and uh, deploy in large scale, what, what are the critical things? What are the barriers you still need to overcome? Uh, well, since this is all happening right now, yeah, I know the, I know the answer to this question. And of course, the, the simple thing is money. That's the answer is money. But uh, let's be more precise. There is no technical impediment at all. There's no scientific impediment. There's no discovery you have to make. The principles are all known. Versions of the technology are deployed. Okay? It turns out it's just straight engineering that you have to pay for. So this technology is very much like building a rocket. It, you need a whole bunch of things to work correctly. And as you know very well, since you run a lab, getting things to work is so hard, but getting things, everything to work at the same time is very hard. And it requires teams of people who are talking to each other. We're finding uh, that the um, turbo machinery community uh, is very risk averse. Uh, and so, for example, steam turbine people who, who have the technology for generation are very reluctant to run their machines backwards to make compressors, even though engineers in the next building over are doing just that. They're making compressors for gas turbines. So that means some a lot of uh, working with teams is necessary and a lot and some experiments. Yeah. And uh, these experiments are are pricey. And so um, I guess the answer is to get the team working together costs money. And so that money required to get the team working together is the key problem. And there aren't any others. Yeah. So Bob, let, let, let me go down to a little bit detail, right? So uh, you show a table with uh, now uh, many, uh, I was say experimental demonstration of uh, using these type of uh, technology similar, Morton salt, right, base. Uh, is there a lifetime consideration due to corrosion from the flowing um, these uh, molten liquid uh, in and out of your system? Uh, we all know molten liquid, uh, these uh, ionic liquid, what is called molten salt, molten ionic liquid now is corrosive. Uh, would the system last for a certain number of years? Uh, is it already well documented and demonstrated? It's already documented and demonstrated. The basic research for this uh, technology was done actually in this country in the 90s. Uh, the technology was first deployed here, but it was deployed commercially first in Spain. So all of those problems had to be discharged before the investors would come in. So the fact that it's deployed in the field tells you that those are non-problems. For a plant, you need, um, you need 40 years. And so there is some corrosion, but it's not, un it's okay in 40 years. Now, a little bit of physics here. Uh, molten salts are actually less corrosive than you might think if there's no water. So mm -hmm. they're, they're, they attack metals like crazy if there's water, but if they're hot, they actually don't. Uh, the major destruction of the metals comes from oxidation. Mm -hmm. So nitrate salts have a lot of oxygen in them and they rust, they rust the iron. 
Now, uh, it's stainless steel, so they don't rust very fast, um, but that's chiefly it. If you're dumb enough to put two different metals in contact uh, with this stuff, of course, that's, that's the end because they're electrolytes. So you have to make sure the material, be careful with materials. But if you are, then electrochemistry doesn't happen and there's no, there's no uh, debilitating problem. Yeah. Uh, next question from uh, an, uh, from the audience. Um, can you describe a little bit about, you know, now you have the heat, right? Exactly the process of heat converting to electricity. Uh, what's the process like? Is, is there a thermoelectric, thermoelectrical conversion system needed? I mean, I, in this no. case, I think, I think. No, uh, no, I rushed through that very yeah, fast. Yeah. Let me just answer in words. Um, it's the same as a steam plant. Okay, so uh, in a steam plant, this is why it's hard to talk to battery people. So there's a different culture where you work with steam. So most of the world's electricity is still generated by steam. And what you do is you make high pressure gas, which is steam, and then you expand it through a turbine mm -hmm. and it gets colder and you get work out that then spins mechanically spins a generator. This mechanical spinning then uh, connects to a highly efficient mechanical generator, which then connects to the grid. This, uh, so the conversion is mechanical. Uh, now, so that's the answer is it, is it is mechanical. Now, as far as the grid operators are concerned, it's very important. The mechanical nature is good because the grid itself is mechanical. It's, it's electric fields going back and forth at 60 Hertz. Mm -hmm. And the generators and loads are all connected with ropes that are made of light. The, tra the, tra the forces travel at the speed of light. So it's mechanical. So when you have um, DC uh, storage media, such as uh, any electrochemistry, you need some semiconductors to fake this mechanical this mechanical motion, and they don't do it very well. So uh, the uh, technology, this particular technology goes back, leverages the fact that the grid is mechanical and generates electricity mechanically. It also takes electricity off the grid mechanically. So the uh, storage process is literally, you take a, a movie of the thing generating and then you run the movie backwards. Yeah. So Bob, um, what's the uh, experimental, uh, well, I think this is for the benefit of audience, right? What's the uh, conversion efficiency during this process, the energy conversion efficiency, right? Using okay. uh, uh, the, from heat to uh, electricity. Is... Many, many people ask this question yeah. and it's just a, it's, it's, a, it's, we have to get a blackboard. So one answer is 100%. So no energy is lost. Now, the better answer is that <clears throat> the um, efficiency concept doesn't apply when you're using the same engine to go backwards. So uh, a typical thermal engine has some efficiency going forward. Well, if, you're, if it doesn't make any entropy uh, and you run it backwards, the storage efficiency is one over the uh, uh, original generation efficiency. So the round trip efficiency is one. Uh, in other words, the, the, the traditional uh, loss, the loss issues actually cancel out when you're doing storage and generation uh, uh, with the same cycle. Now, in reality, the the cycle does generate entropy. And so you have to slough off some of the energy as heat. The answer is asymptotically it's 30%. So asymptotically you lose, you lose a third. The actual amount you lose is greater than that because you have to make engineering compromises. So it's probably in the, in the high 60s. Now I say probably because the amount of this extra loss can be beaten down with money. So if you, if you add more capital cost, you can get the round trip efficiency up. So you have to make a business decision about what's the right, what's the right uh, uh, 
round trip efficiency point. And the current models say it's somewhere in the, in the high 60s. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, next question um, uh, from both audience is from me. So looking at the economics, um, what's the, uh, you know, uh, the upper limit, the size of the system and down limit of system, you know, I, I think down limit, the smallest size right, system starting to make, make sense economically, both in thinking about what the power as well as thinking about the energy, what hour, uh, and uh, you know, you show the table. Some started from fifty megawatt. I remember, right? Some are like hundred in the table. So, and starting from the lower limit, what started to make sense economically and thinking okay. about uh, the size of the system? It, yeah, it, it turns out it's actually backwards. Yeah, the big ones are better. Yes. Okay. And so it's different from batteries. The big ones, the bigger, the bigger you make them, the more efficient. The present target right now is 100 megawatt. Mm -hmm. 100 megawatt in, 100 megawatt out. And it's because the turbo machinery really begins to be efficient when you get that size. So you, what you want is something that looks a lot like a, a steam turbine for, for a commercial power plant. It's just designed so it, so it you know, so there, there's a compressor on it, which there normally isn't. It turns out that making small ones is harder. There's a simple reason why. Um, to, for best efficiency, you need for the blade tip to be moving at about Mach 0.7. So that means if it's smaller, it has to spin faster. So if it's working at 60 Hertz, which is the sort of nominal in this country, the radius has to be about half a meter okay for it can't be any smaller than that because uh, because uh, it has to spin too fast and then you have frequency conversion and as you know there's no way to, to do that it's, it's a physics problem so you can work it you can spin it slower than that as you do in a steam plant but not faster yeah. so the so the small ones are really tough to do and that's interestingly one of the impediments because it's difficult to make a small prototype. Uh, 100 megawatt though, no problem. Uh, and uh, 100 megawatt, look at steam. So 100 to 1,000, so 100 to 1,000 megawatts is kind of the window. The power scales up easily and then the storage time, the marginal cost of the jewel is entirely the salt. And it turns out you look at the numbers, the price numbers, the, the salt is so cheap that there's no advantage to substituting some other storage medium for time scales less than 20 hours. Uh, there, that's, a, that's a corner you don't have to cut. So the, 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 the salt, actually, you just make a bigger tank. Uh, you want, you want uh, you move it up to a day, fine, just make a bigger tank. Yeah. So, Paul, let me ask you one last question before we move on to next talk. Uh, if you can uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, a concise answer, you know. Um, so, looking at lithium ion batteries or other battery technology, let's just pick lithium ion. The cost curve is coming down fast. Um, and uh, and the system level cost, including the cell, right, the, the BMS and, and, and so on, very likely uh, will go down to, well, this is from the EV data, certain degree will be uh, different, uh, down to about, let's see, $100 per kilowatt hour uh, in that range, right? Uh, would that change uh, the whole economics? You're showing this plot right there, you know, uh, that's yeah. by the assumption, the kilowatt hour of the lithium ion battery, I don't know what's the number uh, you use right there, yeah. Okay, now this is a conversation to have with it. This is, of course, the key question because lithium is marching because of other forces, chiefly cars, and yeah. it's the big. That's by far the biggest market. So, so if uh, lithium comes down enough, it will solve this problem. So that's that's basically the question: Is lithium going to come down enough? I think it won't. Now you ask why not? Well, it's just a guess, you know, it's, uh, I'm looking at how 
lithium ion batteries work and how the price has been squeezed out. And I, I just uh, am, I don't believe uh, these uh, the optimistic uh, statements about how the, the battery cost will come down. Uh, what we know right now, as I showed you a plot, we know that prices today are not adequate. The, I had a second line on my graph, which is the aggressive projections of that cost coming coming down, and and you see it's 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 you know it's getting close. So if the lithium uh, batteries in particular came down a factor two, uh, that changes the landscape. Just it just does. So anyway, that's that's the answer. It's it's very close and it's not enough right now. And then if uh, every amazing thing you could project for lithium came true, then it would barely make it into the kind of four to five hour range that you need. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to guess about whether it's gonna make it or not. And my guess is no. There, just parenthetically, <clears throat> there's, a, there's another issue with electrochemistry, which is maintenance. And um, the, uh, these batteries uh, that do this, if they're doing surge leveling, they're working hard, okay? They're discharging and charging every day, all the way. And that's tough on the electrodes. And so there's a downstream cost issue with, with electrode failure that uh, in, in this application that you really have to worry about. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, yeah, Bob, Bob, I think I agree with you is um, lithium ion needs to work hard to this maintenance issue and different uh, temperature, climate environment, charging back and forth. The, the cycle life degree very fast, particularly in the hot environment. Oftentimes where you have solar is uh, it's very hot right there. So lithium ion. Well, well you, don't, you know, you don't run the batteries hot. Uh, I don't think it's a, it's a thermal issue of the batteries. It's a matter of cycle, just, just, just working the electrodes very hard at normal temperatures. In cars, as you know, there's a weight penalty. So when you're designing car batteries or actually for electronics too, it's at paramount to get the, get the weight uh, minimized. In a stationary application, there, there isn't. I think what's going to happen historically is that the, is that most engineers will be working on that weight problem because that's where the money is. And therefore the, the batteries will want, that we'll get are, will be optimized for weight as opposed to uh, uh, cycle rigidity. And uh, that's another reason I'm suspicious that the market just isn't gonna, isn't gonna uh, provide exactly what you need for stationary storage. Okay, well, thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, with that, if you can still stay online with us, you know, later we'll come back to a short panel discussion, right? Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll pass this to uh, Prof Professor Will Chair to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, E and Bob. Thank you for a very insightful lecture. Um, Andrew, if I can also have you come to the stage, please. Terrific. Um, well, Two weeks ago, um, we had the great pleasure of hosting one of Stanford's distinguished alums, uh, J.B. Straubel, um, to speak about scaling up challenges for lithium ion batteries. And today we have another outstanding alum, uh, Andrew Honek, who is the founder and CEO of Entora Energy. So just like yeah, I will tell a little story. Uh, Stanford is a great place, as we, of course, say. And many of these encounters happen in the hallways of a building or sometime between buildings. And uh, I have the great pleasure of seeing some of the early development of Andrew's technology uh, when we were walking between our thermodynamics class in um, Encina Hall, past the Hoover Tower and then back uh, to the home of material science um, in the Duran and McCullough buildings. I think this was three years ago. And we'll talk about all sorts of things and, you know, mostly crazy ideas. So, you know, years later, I was uh, not surprised that uh, the crazy idea turned out to be not so crazy after all. And then Andrew and his colleagues and Tora brought it to life. So it was an amazing journey to, to watch, uh, Andrew. And I should also add, this is not Andrew's first stint. Uh, he, I think we almost lost him to an earlier stint, uh, Dragonfly, 
uh, systems uh, where he was developing uh, power electronics for solar cell, um, which is um, um, being a, an incredible success. I think that was maybe six years ago, Andrew, right? And uh, fortunately, we somehow was able to get him back to Stanford uh, where he was just barely finishing and then found his uh, co-conspirator for Adtora. So in that context, we welcome Andrew, uh, another uh, terrific innovator and, and, and a truly a serial uh, an entrepreneur. And uh, Andrew, we're so delighted to hear about your company and your new technology today. Wonderful. Okay, well, first of all, Will, thank you for the very kind introduction. And uh, I must say, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, you know, it has been a really fun last three years since we were, you know, chatting about all these crazy ideas uh, on, on the walks, as you mentioned. And, and uh, really uh, just, again, an honor for me to be here with, uh, you know, on, on a lineup that includes at some of the other talks, people like J.B. Straubel and Matteo Jaramillo, which have definitely been inspirations for me uh, and our team as we uh, pursue this. So, um, yeah, Antora Energy was founded a, a couple of years ago, um, you know, about a year after some of those conversations uh, Will and I were having uh, after class, um, and uh, really excited to share what we've been up to. All right, so um, I'm going to divide the, the talk into three sections. The first two will go relatively quickly because Professor Laughlin covered them pretty well. You know, why do you need uh, long duration storage? A little bit about why uh, thermal energy storage uh, may be uniquely suited uh, to this problem. And then Antora's approach and, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of the way we're trying to do thermal energy storage versus uh, other approaches, uh, including Professor Laughlin's uh, and, and a number of others out there. All right, so uh, again, the need for long duration storage, uh, you know, for me, it really came uh, out of uh, my time at SunPower, which was the company that acquired my uh, uh, first company, Dragon, Dragonfly Systems. And, um, you know, one of the things is a, as a young engineer working at a, a big company like this, you know, we were very focused on driving down the costs. Um, you know, it, this was an example of a plant that was supposed to be sort of a slam dunk, uh, you know, great solar resource, very close to transmission, had sort of everything going for it. Um, but not only did SunPower see everything was going for this site, but a lot of other companies did too. Everybody installed solar at the same area pretty soon. There was lots of curtailment, negative electricity prices during the day. Um, so it became very clear that storage was gonna be necessary going forward. And this wasn't an original idea that I had, but it, but it was certainly very uh, personal for me, you know, working on the cost side, but then seeing even the cheapest plants not be able to uh, be competitive in the market uh, without, without storage. And, and there are a number of ways to look at the storage problem. Uh, Professor Laughlin, uh, uh, you know, showed one way and, and there's a number of great academic analyses that go into why you need long duration storage. This is just a really quick visual showing, you know, if you have um, the, uh, uh, you know, solar plus wind in California uh, over the last, uh, you know, I think this was in 2017, you can see it's kind of all over the place. If you start filtering that, even with about eight hours of storage, you still have something that kind of can't be relied upon for uh, the grid, you know, every day of the year, if we're trying to go to deep decarbonization and sort of 100% renewables. Um, and it's only once you get about 100 hours or more of storage that it's actually stable enough that you can rely on it, you know, sort of every day of the year. Um, so, so this is this is the problem. Now, a lot of people have been saying for a few years, you know, the long duration storage is needed. It's been certainly talked about in, in academic environments. Um, you know, it was kind of fun for us to start seeing the first, uh, you know, big commercial procurements. Uh, California Community Choice Aggregators put out a call recently for 500 megawatts of longer duration storage. This is eight plus hours. Um, so we're starting to see kind of what was uh, seen a little bit ahead as a, a necessary thing for the grid is start to show up in, in procurements. Very exciting for us, obviously, as a business. Uh, we need to not just uh, think that our stuff is needed, but actually see the customers uh, requesting that. So, um, you know, long duration storage is, is um, you know, it, it's, it's a, a good word in some ways, but in, in, in other ways, it's, it's not so good. When people talk about long duration storage, there's nothing inherently good about a battery that can discharge slowly. You can definitely take a lithium ion battery, for instance, and discharge it really slowly, um, and it'll be you know, long duration. Um, so really, when, when people talk about long duration storage, what, what they really mean is a cheap battery. They mean storage that is so cheap that even if you're only cycling it a few times per year, you can still pay back the capital cost of that battery. And so that, that's sort of reflected in this chart here. If you look at the Department of Energy, they put out this gray target zone. 
And that shows that the longer the duration of the battery, the fewer cycles the battery goes through over the course of a year, and the cheaper the battery has to be to be competitive. And this is sort of the uh, uh, an analogous plot to the one Professor Laughlin showed. This is in dollars per kilowatt hour rather than dollars per kilowatt. Um, so this is why rather than a slope and intercept, you get kind of these asymptotes down. Um, but it, it's, it's the same idea. And I would say, you know, uh, we're maybe a little bit more uh, bullish on, on lithium ion batteries. We, you know, lithium ion batteries are, are quite expensive now. We, we do think that lithium ion battery systems will get to the $100 per kilowatt hour point, which means that by the way, the cells and packs are, are substantially below that in the future. Um, and so we actually think lithium ion is, is going to be a great solution for shorter durations, maybe even up to about 10 hours. Um, but if you look at some of these extremely long durations, like, you know, 50 to 100 hours, um, lithium ion, even in the future, we think is about an order of magnitude off from where it needs to be uh, to be competitive. And so this is really the, the need that we've identified. And I, I will just make a caveat, though, you know, I've put this big green critical need up there that covers 20 to 100 hours. These are very, very different markets. You, you have a very, very different use case for a 20 hour battery versus a 100 hour battery. 100 hour battery may get used largely for resiliency to provide a few days of, of uh, cloudy weather or a few days of resiliency for a public safety uh, power shutoff, which is a, a big market here in, in California due to the fires recently. Um, but the 20 hour battery might be cycled you know, a, a lot more, maybe not fully on a daily basis, but, but more often. So, you know, for especially these longer durations, and you might notice that uh, I'm talking about a little bit longer durations even than uh, Professor Laughlin was, um, one thing that, that's pretty clear is that you need extremely low cost for just the energy component of the system. Um, in fact, we think, you know, for a lot of these longer durations, you really need to be under $10 per kilowatt hour of incremental energy stored in the system. Now, th this is a really, really tough thing to do. And uh, to give one example uh, of why this is so tough, is just to look at the, the cost of the storage. And this is a, a great plot from ARPA-E. Um, this is just showing uh, just the cost of the container. So, you know, let's just put up, you know, some target that you want your, your stuff to be uh, $10 per kilowatt hour um, or less. And, uh, you know, even if you came, if, you know, if you're a researcher, you, you come and you say, hey, I came up with the best ever thermal energy storage or flow battery or whatever, and it uses a free material absolutely free. It co costs nothing. But you say the, the only problem is it doesn't need to be stored in, in stainless steel. Um, if you just look at the cost of the stainless steel tank for your free material, you have to, if you're less than about 150 watt hours per liter, which is a pretty decent energy density for a lot of longer duration storage, you've used up your entire cost budget just on the tank. So this is something that I think um, is, you know, again, lots of reasons that it's hard to get to something like 10. Um, but, but this is one example of how you can't ignore other aspects of the system. It can't just be that your you know, electrolyte or your thermal energy storage medium is cheap. You also have to have other things like a high energy density so the rest of your storage uh, isn't too expensive. I'm sorry, the rest of your system isn't too expensive. All right, so um, thermal energy storage, you know, there's a lot of different types. You know, we think thermal energy storage is pretty uniquely suited uh, to this for a few reasons. And, and the first of which Professor Laughlin covered really well which is safety. You know, we, we, thermal energy is relatively difficult to discharge all at once. Um, and so when you are storing, storing massive amounts of energy, it's very helpful uh, to have uh, it be stored in, in thermal energy rather than chemical or uh, mechanical. Um, you know, another thing that's really important uh, about uh, thermal storage is that you have very cheap raw materials. Um, you know, a, a third thing is you can get very high energy densities and there's a range you know, different um, uh, technologies will have uh, different energy densities, but typically you can get up into those few hundred watt hours per liter, which is really where you need to be. And then, uh, you know, one other thing that again, Professor Laughlin mentioned is if, if you're working with the right technologies, you can have pretty minimal cycle-based degradation. So you can get these long plant lifetimes and uh, you really do see for these utility assets that you wanna have decades of life. And so it, it is helpful to have something that Again, theoretically, there's a lot of ways this can go wrong and we can chat about them, but you can have very minimal degradation. I also wanted to uh, just reference a little bit, um, uh, Professor Laughlin had a very similar uh, uh, picture, but this is one of these great uh, salt storage tanks. I think this one was about a, a gigawatt hour of storage. So it's, it's definitely possible to store huge amounts of energy um, with something like this. 
One area where we differ a little bit, when we were starting out our journey thinking about energy storage and thermal energy storage, when we talked to a lot of the, the folks in um, the concentrated solar world, we actually heard a lot about the, the challenges of working with molten salt, about the corrosion, about the pumps and pipes and heat exchangers and you know, the ability of this salt to freeze and, and cause problems. Um, and so we, we were actually pretty strongly advised that if you can help it, try to stay away from you know, a molten storage medium like that because it can, can cause a lot of headaches. I think one thing that you've seen with that, while there have been pretty substantial deployments of, of thermal energy storage systems using salt, it's actually trailed off quite a bit uh, recently. Uh, there's a lot less interest in this area than there was a few years ago. And simultaneously, you see lithium ion batteries just taking off. And lithium ion, I, I, it either uh, is already or soon will have surpassed all the, the energy storage in, in all of these uh, molten salt tanks around the world. So in, in the past, this was definitely a much bigger thing than electrochemistry, but lithium ion is really taking off. And we expect that to, uh, to continue. So uh, if you want to store energy, the, you know, there are, uh, in, in the form of heat, there are a number of different things that you can use. Again, here's molten salt. You can see relatively cheap under that sort of $10 per kilowatt hour for, for the salt itself. It does have a pretty low energy density. So most of the time, uh, the salt plus the containment ends up at, at over $10 per, per kilowatt hour. I should mention, by the way, these are dollars per kilowatt hour thermal, um, whereas the, the previous plot I used was electric. So all of these get sort of twice as, you know, 2x worse uh, on cost if you have, say, a 50% efficient system, or Professor Laughlin was talking about high 60s, so not quite 2x worse. Um, so some of the other options, uh, by the way, these are, are liquids here in the, in the blue, solids here in the orange. Um, and, you know, concrete, very cheap material, can store a lot of energy. Um, there's a really interesting uh, cluster of, you know, cheap materials, carbon, iron, alumina, uh, that ha you can have pretty high volumetric energy densities and very low cost. These are the ones that we focus on, in particular carbon. Also kind of fun to note, out, note uh, you know, anyone looking at this chart would say, oh, these ones have really high energy density. What are, the, what are these? Silicon and boron, if you actually go through the phase change, like uh, freezing liquid silicon, you can store a ton of energy in a very small space. The problem with these is typically that the containment is actually extremely difficult. Those same freezing issues, um, you know, corrosion issues, get a lot hot, harder at very high temperatures. Um, so again, we're, we're focused on carbon and not only is it pretty good in energy density and in, the, in cost, uh, it has a lot of advantages as far as being very, very temperature stable. Uh, you can take it up to stupid high temperatures and it doesn't really do much. Um, and it's also very thermally conductive, which for a lot of reasons is, is useful. All right. So um, I'll just run into uh, a bit of you know, how Antora is going about thermal energy storage, how it differs from other approaches and, and uh, why we think it's the right way, and, but what are some of the reasons why it, it may not be. Um, so looking at uh, the system, we take electricity in from the grid. We use it to resistively heat. We just dump the electricity directly through uh, carbon, so really cheap storage medium. That gets it hot. Uh, we store that hot material inside an insulated shell um, to try to keep the heat leakage down until we're ready to use that stored thermal energy. We actually get the, the carbon hot enough that it's emitting light. It, it's glowing, mostly in the infrared, but actually hot enough that you can also see it. It's glowing in the visible as well. Um, so we have thermal radiation coming off this uh, thermal energy storage medium. And we actually use photovoltaic cells, very simple conventional solar cells, uh, to convert that thermal radiation directly back into electricity. So that's the part that's maybe a, a bit of a twist, very surprising, is to use photovoltaics um, rather than a, a conventional heat engine like uh, turbo machinery, like a steam or a, a braking cycle uh, turbine. So um, it's still electricity in, electricity out, um, you know, but at the end of the day, the, the energy stored is heat. So why do we want, why do we think this is the right way to do it? The, the first thing is, again, we can use a very, very cheap uh, thermal energy storage medium, carbon. Uh, the, the feedstock here comes from petroleum coke, which is made in massive, massive quantities and, and is pretty nearly free. Also relatively high energy density, which is important. And then the other thing uh, is uh, the photovoltaics. Um, you know, we can piggyback on a lot of the learning and the supply chain that's built up in various uh, parts of the photovoltaics field in the last few decades, rather than building all of that from the ground up. So, you know, photovoltaics are, are really transforming energy generation right now. We're hopeful that we can do the same thing with uh, storage. OK, so this was a very schematic. Uh, we're going to go one, one level deeper into at least a um, cartoon. I'm just going to skip this. Uh, cartoon of the system. 
where you have these um, carbon blocks with slots between them. So the carbon blocks are what's storing the energy. You, you're resistively uh, running current through them to resistively heat them when you want to store the energy. Again, it's within an insulated um, uh, sh steel shell. Um, and then when you want that, that back out, just zooming in here, you put something that looks very similar to a, a solar panel into one of these slots. And that can be soaking up all the light that's coming off of the sides of these hot walls of carbon and, and turning that into electricity. So uh, zooming one more in on that process, um, you have uh, a hot carbon, hot piece of carbon. This thing is sitting up at, uh, you know, over a thousand degrees Celsius, so it's, it's glowing hot. Uh, again, when you want that energy back out, you, you insert this photovoltaic cell. Now, a couple things happen. That uh, hot object is emitting some high energy photons. It's emitting a black body spectrum or a gray body and uh, emitting some high energy photons. Photovoltaics are very, very good at converting those into electrons. That's what they do all day under the sun. That's what they like to do. The problem is for that black body spectrum, uh, there's a lot of light that's coming in uh, the mid or even far infrared. So these are really low energy photons. These photons are below the band gap of the photovoltaic cell. And so uh, they don't get absorbed. So they can't be turned into electrons. They, they don't get absorbed there. It's a, it's a loss mechanism. Uh, one thing that we can do in this application though, is put a very good infrared mirror behind the cell. Um, so this reflects all of that infrared light that's, that's going through the photovoltaic would have been lost, reflect it right back to that hot emitter. So we're recycling all of this energy that would have otherwise been lost. And this allows us to get to much higher uh, efficiencies than standard photovoltaics. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but like any heat engine, it's got a hot side and a cold side. You have to reject heat on the cold side. So we use water cooling. Um, the power densities aren't so uh, high that this is really problematic, uh, but uh, it, it does probably require water cooling. In some cases, we may be able to do um, an, an air-cooled system. Um, all right, so uh, talking about the, the efficiency, which I just sort of teased might be higher than, than solar. Here's kind of the, the you know, spectral way of looking at this. This is where you, you, know, you have some uh, spectrum of light coming from the sun. If you have a single junction cell, you choose one band gap. Uh, you know, the light that's above the band gap gets converted, uh, but you know, if it has too much energy, so that uh, energy kind of goes to waste. It gets thermalized within the semiconductor. Um, and then you have uh, another loss mechanism, uh, which is all of the light that's below the band gap, and that's wasted. And so if we, we look at the analogous picture for thermal photovoltaics uh, using this uh, method, you, you still have um, you know, light above the band gap uh, that gets, uh, if it has too much energy, gets thermalized. Although in this case, because it's only a little bit above the band gap usually, because the whole spectrum is, is sort of red shifted, you actually get less thermalization loss than in a regular solar PV. You do convert some of the light there um, into electricity. Um, and usually that huge loss mechanism, which would have been much bigger if you were kind of doing it in the, the naive way and not trying to recycle any of it. If you do recycle it, you can actually get um, most of that energy back. There will probably be some sliver here at the bottom that it's not a perfect reflector. Um, but overall, that leads you to, to higher efficiency. So a single junction solar cell, there's never been one made over, over 30%. Um, in fact, the, the, the fundamental limit is is 33% approximately, the Schottky Chrysler limit. Um, you know, whereas for a, a single junction thermal photovoltaic, you can actually get over 50%, and the theoretical maximum efficiencies are, are far far higher than that. So this is sort of the fundamental um, difference between solar and and thermal photovoltaics that we take advantage of to get a, a system with with very high efficiency. So here's an example of what one of these cells looks like. Um, this cell was made about a year ago when we first started making these thermophotovoltaic cells. Um, th this cell was made, uh, you know, the, the semiconductor here was grown on basically a hand-built reactor at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, you know, very, very non-commercial. We were very excited because we were able to get pretty good performance. But one of the things that has been very important to us throughout this process is making sure that any technologies uh, we're putting into place are not ones that can only be done in sort of a lab uh, setting and that can't be scaled up and commercialized. And so we've actually taken the same basic design, made some tweaks, um, and but now we're actually producing these cells uh, commercially with a, with a commercial partner on standard equipment. Um, and we're actually able to get even higher efficiencies than we get uh, at, the, at, at NREL. Um, so very exciting to have taken that first step toward commercialization. Now, another thing you might notice about this picture is the cell is very small. This is only about one centimeter on a side. Um, and this is another aspect of thermophotovoltaics that's, that's pretty interesting. This cell in our application 
uh, can do about five to 10 watts. So that's far, far higher than what it, what it could do under the sun. And the reason is that we're much closer to our thermal energy uh, storage medium, this carbon that's emitting the light. We're much closer to that than a solar cell is to the sun. So the amount of light that you're getting per area is, is far higher. And you know, the, the approximate ratio there is, is a few hundred to one. So this is just a little visual example. If you wanted a kilowatt of photovoltaics with standard solar PV, have a few large modules. Basically, you know, one cell sized, one regular solar cell sized object does about a kilowatt in our application. This is also something that's very important for the economics of the system because it means that we can afford to put more money into the, the, the cell per area uh, to get high performance and to have it be a little different than a solar uh, PV cell uh, while still uh, having a very good cost per watt uh, of, the, of the PV. So uh, this is just uh, some, some fun recent data. Uh, and and Torres demonstrated the, the highest uh, efficiency of any uh, uh, thermal photovoltaic cell. But actually beyond that, it's the highest efficiency of any solid state heat engine that isn't using the, the sun as its, uh, as its heat source. So this is more efficient than thermoelectrics or, or thermionics as well, which are two other uh, common solid state heat engines. Um, so you know we're, we're pretty proud of this uh, just for uh, sort of the, the science based part of it, the, the, there's a, a peak efficiency you can see and it rolls off on both sides. The, the left side of that roll off at lower temperatures is because there aren't enough photons above the band gap. So the ratio of how many are useful photons versus bad photons gets worse the farther the lower temperature you go. And on the right side, you're actually getting so much power, so much power per area that you're starting to run into resistive losses. You're trying to push so much current through the cell uh, that, that you're, you're losing some to heat just in, in I squared R losses. So, uh, you know, kind of to compare, our current efficiencies are sitting somewhere between sort of a standard car internal combustion engine and, and a, you know, diesel engine, say in a truck. Um, you know, we do uh, have some near term uh, improvements we think we can make that'll get us up to about 45%. Um, and that's putting us a little closer to very uh, good heat engines like, uh, you know, Toyota Prius, which is a lot better than most cars, a big steam turbine, or even uh, close to sort of the, the best simple cycle, single cycle heat engines, which are. Uh, big marine diesels. All right, um, you know, we're talking about lots of little things or, uh, you know, these cells, you know, there's also the, the big industrial side of this, which is, you know, big blocks of carbon getting really hot and, and all that. We're working on that as well. I'm not going to go into too much of the details, uh, but it's been really fun to kind of move to that larger scale, make sure that we're not missing anything in the rest of the system. Um, and then beyond that, we're um, preparing for a much larger uh, system, which is actually a five megawatt hour uh, customer sited pilot uh, that we're doing near, near Fresno that's supported by the California Energy Commission. Okay, so uh, finishing up here, just wanted to, to be very uh, transparent about the, the pros and cons of this system. So uh, cons first, because they're, they're less fun. Uh, TPV definitely has a higher technical risk than standard heat engines. So, there's a lot of R&D we need to do. You know, we have to take that on. We can't go to a commercial supplier and say, hey, give me a really efficient TPV cell. You know, we have to do that work ourselves. And, and that, that takes time. Another uh, disadvantage of doing this this way is we have a lower efficiency, just sort of fundamentally than a, a system that it uses the heat engine as a heat pump, like Prof Professor Laughlin mentioned. Um, so this means that you know, we're always going to be limited by the efficiency of the PV cell. There aren't too many other loss mechanisms, so we can get pretty close to the PV cell efficiency. But even when we project very far into the future with what we think are, are you know, some of the best cells we can make, we won't see much more than about 50% round trip efficiency on these systems. So definitely lower than the sort of 60 to 70 uh, that you can get with a heat pump system. We haven't seen really strong evidence that the, that the market uh, would prefer, say, a 60 or 70% solution to a cheaper 50% solution. Uh, but, it, but it's certainly a disadvantage, and that's a hypothesis that needs to be tested. Um, and then also by storing the heat at a, at a higher temperature, you do have more heat leakage. So you can solve that by adding more insulation, um, but uh, you know, you're, you're always gonna have a little bit harder challenge there. Uh, we typically design for about 1% per day heat leakage. So if you store for a week, you're maybe losing 5% or a little bit more uh, of, your, of your power. All right, the, the pros. Um, this one is really important, which is that, that by taking a solid state storage medium, the solid carbon, and a solid state heat engine, um, it vastly reduces the cost and complexity of these systems. And this is really, really important uh, for, for large scale deployments and, and is something we've heard sort of over and over again 
um, you know, uh, from our customers that it's really, uh, it, you know, important to keep things simple. Uh, you know, a, a good example of this would be turbo machinery based heat engines like regular power plants often have uh, large numbers of people that are there for operations and, and, and maintenance, uh, a lot of costs there. Hopefully with a, a simpler system, we can get down to, to very minimal uh, O&M comparatively. Uh, an another advantage is that we have very high energy density, you know, by, by using carbon, which is one of the best um, uh, materials for, for energy density um, and using a relatively wide temperature window because we're at these very high temperatures, we can get energy densities per volume that are getting comparable to lithium ion, at least at the sort of pack level, um, not quite at the, at the cell level. And then, uh, you know, this is, this is one that we've really, uh, I think, uh, come to appreciate more and more is that you you have faster design cycles. So we're able to uh, run a new, um, you know, a new TPV cell very, very quickly, make improvements, improve the efficiency, improve other aspects of its performance. Whereas, it, you know, if you're trying to build a big, you know, steam turbine or gas turbine or something like that, um, it, it gets very challenging. It, it often takes a very long time to go through a, a cycle of learning. Um, one other thing, uh, about uh, the system that we really like is fast charging. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's nothing inherently good about uh, a battery being slow. Uh, in fact, you'd rather have it be really cheap and fast. Um, in this case, we're only kind of halfway there. We can charge it really fast because the resistive heating really isn't limited uh, to anything other than how big a transformer and an interconnection you have. Um, so even though we, we discharge a little slower, um, and that's because you know you don't want to pay for too many of these photovoltaic cells. You can charge it, on the other hand, very very fast. Dump electricity from you know otherwise curtailed wind and solar into the device. And then uh, the final thing here is that it's it's very scalable and modular. And this also is a little bit related to those faster design cycles. Um, but the modular aspect means we can test on small scales and have a very strong idea of how that performance is going to be on a larger scale because it's just the same unit repeated over and over. There isn't the same uh, scaling factors, uh, for example, that Professor Laughlin was talking about with turbo machinery. And then also on the scalable side, you know, uh, we've seen exactly the same thing that Professor Laughlin mentioned about, you know, you need these turbo machinery units to be quite big, you know, 100 megawatts in, in many cases. You know, you might be able to get down into the tens of megawatts, but it's not going to work at a much smaller scale. And we've seen that there, first, there are some aspects of the market that uh, we can address by going down to, say, the megawatt level that a turbo machinery solution couldn't. Uh, but then finally, this is actually just a, a money question. It's a lot easier to sell your first units when they cost a million dollars versus a hundred million dollars. And so it really reduces the finance risk and sort of the rollout of this technology to have, you know, bite-sized pieces uh, for the system. Okay, so those are uh, pros, and, pros and cons of the system. Um, you know, all, all done here. Uh, I just really want to thank again the, the, the organizers here for inviting me. And also uh, a shameless plug. Uh, we're, we're always hiring, and uh, for those who are might be Stanford students, we, we do have an internship position open now. We have other positions that will open in the future. Uh, so uh, regardless of your background, please uh, send us a note at hiring at Antora.energy. Love to hear from you. Okay. Andrew, thank you very much uh, for the talk, uh, both the technical side and the business side. Um, we really appreciate it. So time for questions. Um, let me maybe start off with one of my own question. And this is, I think, just due to time limitation. You focused the talk mostly on your power module, the, um, the thermal PV. Um, can you talk about the challenges on the energy side? Um, so you mentioned the heat leak, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Another thing I could think about is the high temperature storage would also effectively increase the containment cost as well. Um, what are some of the challenges there? What are you working on? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so uh, a couple of things there. I think the first thing is, um, one thing that we, we like about the, the system side is that there are a number of high temperature industrial processes that look relatively similar to this, use similar temperatures. Um, there's even a, um, a technology or, or a manufacturing method for, for graphite, where you have these big graphitization furnaces, looks very, very similar to what we have. You run current directly through the graphite, you pack it with a bunch of insulation, you operate it at even higher temperatures than we're operating at. So there's some sort of industrial analogs that gives us a lot of confidence uh, that, that uh, this is not going to be the, the hardest part of the system. One thing that I, I didn't mention is we do, um, you know, that steel shell that I mentioned has the insulation inside of it. So the steel shell, sort of the containment doesn't go to a very high temperature. And that's something that's really nice uh, when you have a solid storage medium. You know, it doesn't sort of fill all the nooks and crannies. So it's really easy to just, you know, have the solid storage, 
pack insulation around it, pack a shell around it, that shell can stay cool. That really helps the containment cost. We don't need any fancy uh, materials there. Uh, but we do use a, an inert gas. So, uh, you know, carbon uh, at these temperatures will oxidize. Uh, it actually won't burn. They use uh, graphite electrodes uh, in the steel industry in air. They slowly corrode uh, in the oxygen, but they don't burn. Uh, but we do have to keep an inert atmosphere so that we have the, the long life there. So that's another aspect of the system that's, uh, you know, needs to be thought about. Thank you. Um, just to follow up a little bit more on that point. So in your in your cost analysis plot of the container, you know, you show even stainless steel is quite prohibitive. But am yeah. I correct to understand that where you could win is on the x-axis, you're moving high energy density. So you're still using um, somewhat expensive containment, but just much less of it. Yeah, we both think that we can use, we don't have to use stainless steel, for instance, because uh, it's at cooler temperatures, there's no corrosive uh, stuff in there. Um, and then also, yeah, higher energy density, those two combined can bring it down from you know, kind of the, the random place I put, which was, you know, $10 per kilowatt hour down to half of that or less uh, for the containment, which is really mm -hmm. important for the uh, economics. Terrific. Um, let me move into uh, more of a material science aspect uh, of the TPV. Um, so, you know, here at Stanford and, and many other places, um, spectral selectivity has really taken off as um, not only for heating, but also for cooling. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, E is an expert in this area. Um, I know that this is not something that the TPV has really focused on. And I think you're here, you're using a, a mirror basic at the back, IR mirror to help with it. Are, are there any opportunities for spectral selectivity on the front side of the cell um, to really help balance um, the emission versus absorption? Um, any opportunities there? Yes, absolutely. And, and this has been looked at in, in the rather small TPV community uh, for a while. Um, there are really three places people look at, at selectivity. One is make a, a special emitter, the, the hot object, that emits only the photons you want. As you mentioned, put a filter between the emitter and the cell, could be on the front of the cell, that reflects back whatever photons you don't want. Or as we do, put the mirror on the back, let them come through the, the, the cell and reflect them all the way back out. Um, just on, on the, the first one, the, the selective emitter, what we found is that um, the selective emitters we've seen don't perform all that well compared to the other methods. And there's also a, a degradation uh, and cost problem. Basically, you know, in our view, you want to keep whatever's hot in the system absolutely as simple as possible. So for us, big dumb carbon blocks that never move and just sit there their whole life, that's about the only thing you want to be hot in the system. Um, you know, the, the filters we think have more promise uh, than the, the selective emitters, um, but still have, have some challenges. And what we found is that uh, we can actually create a better reflector using the, the semiconductor itself as sort of a filter where it absorbs the above band gap light and lets the rest through and then sort of a non-selective mirror behind that, the combination of those two uh, can perform better than the, the front mirror. You can, by the way, also combine these different methods of selectivity. It's possible we'll do that in the future, but we don't think we need to right now. Terrific, um, Andrew. So uh, let me ask, uh, uh, get a question from the audience. Uh, so Jeff McConaughey from Stanford asks, um, I think this is inspired by your plot on the efficiency and comparing that to various uh, internal combustion engines for cars. Mm -hmm. um, is there an opportunity to use TPV as a way to convert the thermal energy from combusting fuel to electricity, say for mobile applications or stationary? So not for storage, so just one way to go from um, chemical to heat to electricity uh, rather than say chemical to heat to mechanical. Uh, for propelling a car. Any opportunities there? Because I, I think the efficiency comparison was quite striking, uh, even at yeah. a small scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, so we, we have looked at that in a couple of applications. This isn't our main focus. Um, you know, a, a good example of where this might uh, work. So in, in cars, we think lithium ion batteries are, are, are going to work. There's, there's no reason. And we don't really want people to be burning fuels in, in cars anyway. So that's not something we're so interested in pursuing. But absolutely, the general idea of, of, of combustion and using the TPV for that is, is interesting. A, a couple of places we have looked at, one is something like biogas. So, um, you know, biogas coming off of, you know, uh, wastewater treatment plants, anaerobic digesters taking like cow manure and these sorts of things. It's often really nasty gas and you have to do a lot of work to clean it up if you want to put it into a pipeline as renewable natural gas or if you want to burn it in a turbine engine. And, and uh, also you, you typically have these really small sources of this gas. And so a good, a good place that we would be interested uh, at some point in the future, perhaps in, in looking at 
is, you know, can you have uh, a small source of renewable natural gas, combust that, use the TPV to convert that into energy? Because it's sort of an external combustion engine, uh, it can be very tolerant to whatever impurities or uh, low BTU content of the gas, all of those other things. So absolutely, there's some really interesting applications of this outside of, of just storage. Great. Um, so related to this question, um, is there an optimal scale for the TPV in terms of size? Um, you know, how big does it have to be and how does it scale um, as you make it bigger? Yeah, yeah. So the, the TPV itself um, scales uh, pretty, or is pretty independent of scale. So the, the performance should be about the same. You know, uh, the TPV cells themselves, we need to keep relatively small uh, because they produce so much power per area. Uh, it just gets uh, unwieldy if you have, you know, a, a kilowatt or 10 kilowatts coming off of a single cell. Uh, so we keep the cells pretty small, but once you tile them into a module, it doesn't matter if that module's, you know, that big or that big or, you know, really, really big um, in order to do that. On the system side, though, I, I will mention, you know, uh, you know, the, the power conversion side is scale independent. The system side, you do get lower heat leakage the bigger you make this system. Um, ju that's just surface area to volume ratio. So uh, you, you probably don't wanna go below tens of megawatt hours of storage. So let's say it's a 50 hour system, one megawatt, 50 megawatt hours. That would be sort of a, a small system for us. Um, you know, very small compared to say a turbo machinery based solution, but still not so much like a household scale or, or something like that. Terrific. Maybe I can make one observation. Uh, maybe this could be a seed for the panel discussion in a minute or two. Um, I, I think, Andrew, your technology really strikes me as um, really fulfilling the energy to power ratio conundrum for long duration storage. So your storage um, has to have scale, right? The energy has to have scale. So it has to be large to minimize heat loss. But your power stack actually works very well at small scale, just like electrochemistry. Yes. So I think in that sense, it's somewhat similar to a flow battery where you have a, a very nice decoupling. But also, I think um, um, the, the size dependence is also different. So allowing E2P to scale really nicely. Uh, and I think maybe this is a question that Bob can also talk about as sort of the E2P aspect um, for using the Brayton cycle, for example as the power module, which I think will be, uh, has to be larger in size. So it, it seems like uh, there could be nice complementarity between the two technologies uh, in terms of the size of deployment. Absolutely. Um, so with that, Andrew, thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts again. And if I could ask everybody to rejoin, uh, I think we have about uh, 15, 20 minutes for hopefully another spirited discussion. E and Bob, welcome back. Well, yeah. Andrew, great talk. Yeah, I have to do all these zoomy things here. <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 I'm resumed, so to speak. So, so, uh, maybe well, we'll, we, we can do it in this way. Bob, did you hear uh, Will's questions about this E to P uh, ratio and uh, and any? Uh, I yeah. did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you want to. Are, are we are we paneling now? Is this is this a panel discussion that, thing? That, that's right. <laughs> a spirited well, panel discussion. You know, um, once we start talking about this and things like it, uh, we're we're this is business model issues, okay? And um, so I have to have dollars in the sentence for me to pay attention. The um, that energy to power ratio is an engineering concept. What I need to know is what's the dollars per stored joule and the dollars per watt of the engine. And um, the, uh, the marketplace, at least that I see, is, is going to be just vicious on those things. Right now, uh, it's uh, for the battery dominated parts of the market, it's vicious in cost per watt, okay? Uh, and that's why batteries are 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 doing well. They have a low they have a low cost per watt, but they have this this energy to power problem that gets worse and worse and worse as you get the longer duration. Um, so, uh, so nothing. So what I hope you could refocus on is not what that ratio is as an engineering concept, but what the dollar ratio is as a business concept. Um, uh, well, Andrew, do you have some comment on that? Uh, 
on this question. I do have question following question related to this. I, I want to give you the chance to say it first. Oh yeah, I, I was just going to mention. I, I think that's that's exactly the right way to think about it. You know, you have to think about dollars per watt or dollars per kilowatt, and then the, the dollars per kilowatt hour, the dollars per energy, and that that's one area. You know, we're often looking at at longer durations because we think we have a bigger advantage in those areas because we have a very very low per energy cost. You know, lower uh, materials and containment costs than, than molten salt, and so that kind of pushes us toward uh, you know having a, a bigger delta at, at longer durations. Um, I, you know, from a business perspective, also we see there, we think there's going to be a lot of competition. Again, maybe I, I'm a little bit more bullish than you, Professor Laughlin, about the lithium ion world. We think there's going to be a lot of competition anywhere in the kind of 10 hours or less category uh, from lithium ion batteries. And what, what we really wanted to make sure we didn't do was end up with a solution where our selling point was hey, we're going to be, you know, 20%, 30% cheaper than a lithium ion battery. And there's no way that a, a, a reasonable uh, financier or, or utility is going to want uh, to go for a really untested technology over something that now is quite tried and true, like lithium ion installations, if there's a small cost delta. So that has also pushed us to say, you know, what are the areas kind of far away from lithium ion batteries uh, where there's a big hole in the marketplace? Yeah. Can, I, can I weigh in on this, please? That's correct. Um, the, uh, the lithium situation is the, is the elephant in the room. And uh, how one approaches the problem depends critically on how one measures that. Now, um, and you know, you can err either way. Uh, uh, for, for business perspective, you want to find a market that you can get and that isn't going to be taken by somebody else. So I'm, that's totally right. The difficulty we face is the first market that matters is the eight to 10 hour one. That's the first market that matters that hasn't been nipped off by, by lithium. So the, you know, you can go to longer times, which I'm interested in as well, uh, even seasonal. But the problem is the immediate cash mm -hmm. is in this shorter time scale. And so what you're betting you know, one way is whether the lithium people are going to nip off that piece or not. Uh, I'm aware of the, um, uh, you're right about the business problem. It's one of the difficulties I faced. Uh, and, okay, this is sort of obvious now. So the, the assessment that the lithium people are going to have trouble is personal. And like all personal assessments, you know, you put your money on the line and see what happens. I, uh, so we'll see. Yeah. So I, I have a, a follow-on question kind of related, but slightly different. Um, so look at E to P ratio and also dollar coming in, right? I, 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 let's look into more, slightly more complex situation. Um, so when you talk about a long duration, when you think about more than 10 hours, maybe five days, right? So that situation, this is uh, only thing about one situation. But in reality, uh, the when you install something in the grid scale storage in that station, a really big one, you actually use that for multi-purpose. And, and long duration at the same time, day to day, this operation power in and out, you know, hour to hour. So and then you look at the characteristic uh, of the technolo technology characteristic, uh, both of you work on a different one, you know, sharing some commonality right here. I, I, every time I think about lithium, you know, lithium can have very low power cost. If lithium you are running it, doing fast discharge, so let's say one hour or, uh, you know, 30 minutes, actually the power cost goes down. But once you store more energy, you need to have the energy right there. You discharge long duration. That's the power rating. The cost goes, uh, will, will increase. However, under the situation, sometimes you you do need to you know do that hour, thirty minutes charging, discharging, and then sometimes you can do you know five to ten hours under this complex situation. Now, what's your thought about uh? the comparison, right? What you're working on with lithium and then thinking about your technology characteristics, how that changed the whole cost argument, the dollar. Who's first? Yeah. You go first, Andrew. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a crack at this. So um, 
Yeah, I, I think this is a really interesting uh, area. You know, there's there's right now value stacking. You know, trying to do you know different things with the same battery as we're talking about is is pretty much necessary for most of these energy storage installations. And and of course, there's a there's a whole spectrum of durations of energy storage. You know, from balancing really quick fluctuations on the grid to you know longer. You know, 15 minute, one hour. You know, and then there's a the long duration. You know, we um, when when we look at the modeling. We really think that those shorter there's going to be enough lithium ion on the grid that all of those shorter duration things that you would do trying to balance you know with you know every 15 minutes or something like that there's going to be enough lithium ion that it's going to soak up all the potential in that area so in our models we typically don't imagine that we're going to be value stacking those short duration services on top of the longer duration services when when we look at um you know the, the different areas that we might be uh, addressing it would be more like we're doing some sort of diurnal cycling, you know, near the top of our, our thermal SOC. Uh, and then every once in a while, you know, maybe doing a few days worth of discharge because there's low solar and then, you know, back up again and then, and then that. Whereas we're not going to be, I think, uh, dealing with the, the really, really small fluctuations because lithium ion does a, a good job of, of that. Mm -hmm. Bob. Yeah, I concur completely. Uh, uh, the, the graph that I showed demonstrates that this battle is over that lithium has already won it. And I say lithium as opposed to other electrochemistry. It's so far ahead in, the, in lowering the production costs um, that I don't think anybody else can catch up to it. And so that's, that's a done deal. The, uh, the phase leveling time scales of 20 minutes to half hour in there, that's uh, going to be lithium, uh, I think forever. And this, by the way, includes all sorts of quick response issues. Like, for example, you're running a company and the grid goes out, okay? And you need your backup to come in real fast uh, so that to not wreck all the memory of your computers. That's a job for batteries. And so I can foresee uh, batteries taking over that. And then if you have a problem longer, longer than 30 minutes or an hour, then you bring online something else that won't respond quite so quickly, uh, but lasts but lasts longer and it's cheaper. This, by the way, changes also the engineering mandate for alternatives. So when you're, if there's no lithium, you have to design a machine that will respond fast. On the other hand, in a world where lithium has taken care of that problem, uh, your design problem uh, is easier because the machine you have to be has has to be steady, has to have time scales that are typical of a modern gas turbine, say 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, and the quick response issues are now not a non-problem. Yeah, thanks, Bob. We'll pass back to you. Thank you. Um, so Bob and Andrew, I since we're talking about dollar, I thought I would go there even a little bit further. Um, so this is a point very obvious to both of you, but just for all of our audience listeners as well, the, the value of long duration, longer duration storage really also depends on the level of decarbonization we desire in the electrical grid. And obviously this is highly tied to policy, cost of carbon and so forth. Um, at the current deployment, right, um, very low, um, uh, a sort of modest uh, penetration of variable generation on the grid. Um, what is the, can you help us understand what is the market size, the potential revenue from say, you know, a hundred hour storage level versus sort of the uh, 30 minute frequency regulation to something more intermediate. Um, do you have a good understanding of how much money there is um, today at the current level or um, put another way, uh, what levels do you think that your technology will tar will require in terms of um, variable generation penetration on the grid in order for a longer duration to really kick in and create the market? Um, or is it already here today? Again, I'll defer to you, Andrew, first. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, it's a good question. And, and as a business, you know, we're, we're obviously very uh, aware of this. You know, we don't, you know, it's very difficult if we're creating a technology that isn't going to be used for 10 years, that would be a very tough position to be in. Uh, fortunately, a couple of things that, that we've seen, one is that um, even while you're at a, a certain penetration level on the grid as a whole, 
um, you get much more uh, extreme localized effects. And, and Professor Laughlin mentioned this in, in a few locations around the world where, you know, locally on the grid, you know, in uh, parts of Texas or parts of China, you have so much renewables that you really have hit that nearly 100% renewables uh, land where, where you really need this long duration storage. And so it's sort of a slow roll on from, you know, kind of isolated geographies where you have specific conditions toward the grid as a whole over time. And if it weren't for that, I would honestly say it'd be very, very challenging to commercialize uh, any long duration storage if we had to wait for, you know, 10 years when everything was going to flip and then suddenly we, we need it. Um, so, so it rolls on in different places at different times. There's also a number of interesting, um, you know, aspects, like I, I mentioned, uh, the public safety power shutoffs, things that are requiring long duration storage for reasons other than uh, just a, a, you know, renewables penetration uh, getting so high. And those are also stepping stone markets that I think, you know, and Tora, but, but also many of the companies in this area are going to be looking at uh, in the meantime. And these are pretty big markets, you know, hundreds of millions or billion dollar markets for resiliency. Um, but it's not the, you know, hundreds of billions of dollar market of the grid as a whole. Um, okay, my turn. Uh, uh, a little more bullish, um, but, you know, again, sort of along the same lines, but a little more bullish. First of all, I'll point out to everybody that in this country, it's a non-starter while without regulation because no one can beat natural gas in a fair fight. So in places where natural gas is extremely plentiful, as is the case here in North America, it's, an, it's very political, this question. So in California at the moment, for example, there is a great... Um, desire to decarbonize completely. Whether that's going to happen or not, we'll see. But uh, if the laws weren't there, it would definitely not happen because uh, this is a natural gas state and natural gas is cheaper and better than these other things. Now, we can refocus the, comp the question though, places like Germany or most of China, okay? Uh, that are not natural gas rich. And in fact, Germans are importing a stupendous amount of natural gas right now through the Nord Stream pipeline and about to double it with Nord Stream 2. Uh, so this is good for decarbonizing Germany, but it's a national security issue because you're importing all your energy. Uh, this is also the case uh, in China. So the, the, there's a, there are political reasons, international political reasons to cut back on coal mighty hard to do and the natural gas assets aren't there at the moment so natural gas is imported from Russia. Now in those, those markets are very different from the ones uh, that we have here. Uh, in Europe uh, I think uh, the, the, the need is strong enough that the market would make itself. In other words uh, the utilities right now have nothing to buy so, so they're stuck, you know, they have to use water and import natural gas. But if you gave them something to buy, they would do a business calculus and think, you know, well, do I need to import all that gas? And if your answer is we can, we can stop it, um, they, they, I think they would. So I think the Northern Europe market is very strong. It's a little harder to call in China because of coal politics in China, which is, you know, like coal politics everywhere. It's just more because there's more coal used in China. I think the answer is that it's like Europe. I think the answer is there's enough pressure and also internal desire to cut down on coal um, that uh, the technology uh, would, would make its own market. All right, anyways, so it's position dependent, the answer. Yeah. Well, you have something you want to follow on? Yeah, if I, I don't mind, Bob, uh, if you don't mind, um, Bob, let me, you, you brought up a very important point, which is, um, it leads to this issue of CO2 footprint as well, something that um, we didn't discuss today. Uh, and this is really where lithium ion battery on a life cycle basis, the CO2 footprint isn't small. It's, it's, it's pretty large. Um, you know, Andrew, I couldn't help to notice that you're using a lot of carbon. So maybe this is, can be viewed as carbon negative in, in some sense. Um, but of course, it takes carbon to manufacture all the parts, a CO2 to make all the parts too. Um, have you thought far enough in terms of what the CO2 footprint might be? C could the thermal technology be more competitive on the CO2 footprint? 
than lithium ion battery that could have also other impact on sustainability as well. Yeah. Okay. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just 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 really briefly. Um, certainly, I would I would say we you know we're excited about the fact that we think we have a, a lower CO two footprint in in manufacturing, but we don't think that'll actually be a, a big competitive uh, aspect of the technology. I, I don't. Our, our personal view is that the the CO two footprint of current lithium ion batteries is not so high that that is going to prevent deployment. We think the the economics are going to drive that. Uh, you know, much faster than any uh, hesitation a, a, about the, the CO2. Um, you know, a, as you mentioned, I, I don't know if it's it's carbon negative, but, uh, you know, by certain definitions, but we certainly do like the fact most of this pet coke right now that we'd be using to make our, our batteries um, gets burned in coal-fired power plants. Um, and so it's, it's pretty nice to be diverting some of that stream that would have otherwise gone into the atmosphere. Um, one fun thing that I, I know I've, I've spoken with a, a few people recently about is, um, you know, there are other technologies like methane pyrolysis that might produce vast quantities of, of carbon that we don't really know what to do with yet. Um, and so we're also excited to provide a, a sink for, for some of those things. Okay, uh, I, think, I think I'm on board with this one too. Um, the carbon footprint of manufacture is something that concerns the Precord Institute a lot. And I think that concern is incredibly misplaced. Uh, this may be something you worry about two centuries from now, but right now it's not the problem. Uh, there's a series of more urgent problems that the wind cannot penetrate more than 30% without a new invention. And that's the problem to solve right now. And the, uh, the later, the more cosmic things will sort of solve later. Um, so um, in physics, you know, we have the, from Wolfgang Pauli, you know, there's these th three levels of significance, you know, there's right, wrong, and not even wrong. This uh, carbon mm -hmm. footprint thing is not even wrong. <laughs> well, very interesting answer. I, I, I want to switch gear a little bit and by asking both of you this question. Um, when I compare uh, looking at the lithium ion battery's history, right, and uh, when you know, the battery was developed in 1970s, starting that lithium metal and so on. It, it was about energy crisis. It turned out to be, you know, 40 years later, close to 50 years later, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's also for fighting this purpose. But in the, in, you know, during this time period, about 50 years, um, lithium ion had been through a history of uh, powering consumer electronics first in the market. And then with about 15 years, you know, of history on that, and then going to electrical car and the cost going down, performance cycle life is going better, you know, things get better and better, uh, safety gets better, right? The electrical car now uh, is dominating by uh, lithium ion. Now lithium ion coming into the grid. So it, it has this uh, market sector one by one, just keep uh, coming up, you know, with the technology growing, the cost and uh, making sense, just the sequence right there. My question now come to both of you for the thermal base uh, storage. Would you be able to imagine some other market application sectors that's not entirely stationarily connect with solar with wind yet allows you to explore first uh, and uh, before you go to the scale of doing solo the bin right away. And wh wh whether that makes sense or, or not, I, I, I don't know. So uh, just brainstorming, you know, uh, just other applications, you could also leverage to build up the manufacturing of your technology to reduce the cost, to get everything, you know, behind you to support these, uh, these, these type of technologies. You're on, Andrew. All right, perfect. <laughs> this is this is a, a, a very good question. This is something we think a lot about because I think you see this in almost every technology adoption. You know, you have these these stepping stones of, of smaller markets, maybe that are less price sensitive to larger ones that are a little bit or, or that are yeah that are more price sensitive to really large ones that you have to be very very low cost. And there aren't a lot of examples of technologies that leapfrog all of those and get right to the end. You know, massive scale and, and very low cost. You know, I, certainly I, I saw that also in, in solar, exactly the same thing as, as batteries where you have, you know, you put them on buoys and then you put them on, you know, rich people's houses and then you start installing them in the desert, you know, big uh, changes in scale. 
Um, and uh, really, uh, you know, we, we, a couple of thoughts here. First of all, we, we hope we can piggyback a little bit again on the photovoltaics journey. You know, th this is something that has been developed for decades. You know, most we're trying to combine, you know, photovoltaics technology that is more developed and this sort of more standard industrial high temperature storage, like I mentioned, you know, that a graphitization furnace so that hopefully we can leapfrog some of those early ones by uh, taking advantage of other industries. But e even within that, uh, you know, we absolutely are always looking for markets that are those smaller, earlier markets might have something special about them that allows us to operate in, in them first before we get to the really large eventual markets. I mentioned uh, PSPS markets. And I think this is actually something also that Professor Laughlin uh, alluded to, if I'm not mistaken, was, you know, what is the waste heat coming out of these, these systems? You know, that's another thing that we're, we're looking at. One of our uh, potential early customers is very interested in this for combined heat and power applications. So getting the electricity out of the, the storage, but then also using the heat for uh, agricultural processing in, in, in this case. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely, we're looking for these areas that are, are stepping stones to the larger, just like lithium ion batteries had you know, uh, consumer electronics. Okay, yeah, um, that's right. Okay. The, the history shows you need little steps. Now, uh, man, I thought about this endlessly, you know, endless hours thinking about this. And the conclusion I came to was that this problem is why the technology doesn't exist yet. In other words, the blockages to making little steps are fundamental. And that is why they haven't happened. And the energy industry as it exists today kind of counts on that. The, the, uh, the entry barrier to actually nailing the problem uh, is very high. Uh, one of the things I hope that came out in my own lecture is that if you wanted to solve it right now and they, and the feds were to decide they want to do it, boom, six months, okay? Because all the parts of how to do it are actually necessary. So the constraints all come from costs and in particular this, this issue of doing it incrementally. Uh, so you know, it's going to work out the way it works out. It might turn out that you can do it incrementally, or it might turn out that this is more like building a rocket, that you just have to build one, and you need a big enough money source to actually do it to get over the hump. Now, um, so history is going to now work out, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, one thing for sure, this, this question um, is fundamental. It's a fundamental question. Is this problem like solar cells or is it this problem like rockets? Thank um, you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah a, go ahead. what an inspirational note um, on which we can end our session. Um, I was looking forward to a spirited discussion. I think we had one. Um, thank you both again for taking your early morning today to talk to us, uh, Ian and I, and also um, the rest joining from across the world. It's been a, a very much a learning experience. Um, best of luck um, to the both of you for uh, scaling up the technologies and um, very excited to see where it goes next. Um, so if I could have the uh, closing slide, please, Justin, thank you very much. Um, so as Ian mentioned, we are on this session of uh, uh, this uh, several sessions on understanding X beyond uh, just batteries, uh, but we'll actually take a, a brief um, return to chemistry of batteries. And uh, so in two weeks, we will have our very own Professor Zenan Bao uh, and Eric Quaxman from the University of Maryland to talk about chemistry. And then uh, three weeks later, right after Thanksgiving, we will have our final talk for the year um, in which we will come back to the topic of long duration storage. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you all for participating. And uh, Andrew and Bob, thanks again for taking the time. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Paul thank you. and Andrew. Have a good morning. Thank you.